welcome back to Communists of America. Last week, we talked about the discontent that the American working class has with the American political system, and especially their majority rejection of both political parties. This was just one part of the reason that we launched the Class War 2024 campaign. Definitely listen to that episode if you haven't yet. In this episode, we're going to hear from cells all across the country on the results that they've had from launching this campaign, the various activities that we have engaged in to meet people where they're at and put this perspective in front of them, not only to explain our ideas, but recruit people from the communist generation and even beyond the 63% of U.S. adults that believe that a third major party is needed. We are out there presenting people with that third party that we have to build, the party of the working class. And we understand that that party necessarily has to be a communist party. I'd like to start this episode with a reiteration of the quote from Lenin, where he says, the communists in Western Europe and America must learn to create new, unusual, non-opportunist, non-careerist parliamentarism. The communist parties must issue their slogans, real proletarians, with the help of the unorganized and downtrodden poor, should scatter and distribute leaflets, canvas workers' houses, and the cottages of the rural proletarians and peasants in the remote villages. Fortunately, there are many times less remote villages in Europe than in Russia, and in England the number is very small. They should go into the most common taverns, penetrate into the unions, societies, and casual meetings where the common people gather, and talk to the people, not in learned and in not in very parliamentary language. They should not at all strive to get seats in parliament, but should everywhere strive to rouse the minds of the masses and draw them into the struggle to hold the bourgeoisie to its word and utilize the apparatus it has set up, the elections it has appointed, the appeals it has made to the whole people, and to tell the people what Bolshevism is in a way that has never been possible outside of election times. Not counting, of course, times of big strikes, when in Russia a similar apparatus for widespread popular agitation worked even more intensively. It is very difficult to do this in Western Europe and America, very, very difficult, but it can and must be done. For the task of communism cannot be fulfilled without effort, and our efforts must be devoted to fulfilling practical tasks, ever more varied, ever more closely connected with all branches of social life, winning branch after branch and sphere after sphere from the bourgeoisie. We bring that quote to you again at its full length because this episode will outline how it is that we have taken this brilliant but simple advice from Lenin and actually applied that to the cities that we're in and the conditions that they have. Now, Lenin said that during a strike, and I think that this applies to protest movements as well, when these events happen, the party has to be there to do widespread popular agitation, especially based off of whatever that event is, whether it's a strike or a protest in reaction to a police murder, or for instance, as we saw recently, the genocide in Gaza. In those instances of a strike or a protest, there is a specific issue that we can talk about with people, and their energy is focused on that already, and they're already energized and out in the streets. But how do we sustain a level of agitation that is during an election season where people are still going about their day. They're not marching in the streets necessarily. They are going to work. They're taking care of their families at their homes. They are commuting to school. We have to employ a variety of tactics to meet these people where they're at. And this is often done through tabling and agitation on campuses and street corners and anywhere with a lot of foot traffic. A lot of this episode and the way that it starts is talking about door knocking, but you should definitely employ a variety of tactics. We still want to build on campuses where we have a presence all over the country. If you are near a campus, you should agitate and table on the campus. If you're in a big city, 
you should go to parks and street corners to table. Anywhere where you'll find a lot of people and anywhere where you could potentially run into a communist that isn't organized yet. The anecdotes from this episode will demonstrate even a cold introduction to somebody like knocking on somebody's door and explaining ourselves and what we're trying to build can also be an effective tactic. You're going to hear from some comrades from Philadelphia, New York, and San Diego about the challenges that they found when they adopted an initiative of going around and knocking on people's doors, which can be challenging because it's not always just that easy of going and knocking on people's doors. And it could also be a little bit scary. You don't know how somebody's going to react to what you're saying, but the Bolshevik method is that of smashing obstacles and we have to go out boldly and i think that something that we can learn from these comrades is how to do that how to smash the obstacles but also get a sense of reassurance that we will meet people that agree with our ideas but only if we take these kinds of bold initiatives for the start of the class war 2024 campaign here in queens new york comrades decided that we wanted to experiment with essentially canvassing door knocking going directly to people in their apartments and homes and talking to them about the class war, about the need for a class independent workers party, and about communism. And the results we got were very inspiring, very interesting, uh, definitely indicate that we should continue uh, pursuing that alongside any forms of public activity because um, the people who are interested in these ideas are out there. It's very clear, it's just a matter of reaching them. And so that was our intent at this launch day on Saturday. Another comrade and I were door knocking within apartment buildings, and that itself was an interesting experience. In fact, at one point, uh, most and most apartments here in New York are locked. You have to get buzzed in to get in. And so we just dialed the first person on the directory. They immediately answered actually and said, who is this? And I just plainly said, hi, this is Bryce with the Class War 2024 campaign. We're talking to people about issues that affect workers We opposed the war in Gaza. We want to talk to people about that. I left it at that, and they just buzzed me, and they, you know, they heard that political uh, appeal, that political pitch, and they, they, you know, welcomed us in. And so we door knocked within uh, several apartment buildings like this. Quite a few people weren't home, but the ones who uh, did answer, we had some good conversations. I talked to one young Bangladeshi couple, uh, who immediately, when I asked them. Uh, do you feel represented by either of the two parties? They said, well, we're uncommitted we're, for obvious reasons. And I said, is that because of the war in Gaza? And they said, yes. And I said, well, yeah, I think there's no choice for, for, for people who uh, oppose the war in Gaza. Both parties are committed to unconditionally supporting Israel. Um, I talked about uh, how we need a class independent, a workers party to uh, oppose the war. And they completely agreed with that. They're extremely... Um, I think surprised and, and excited to be uh, to be canvassed by people with that kind of political outlook. And so we stopped and talked for about 10 minutes about uh, not just Gaza, but also things like the um, huge inequality in CEO pay versus average workers pay, and just some other basic statistics about the class disparity, about the class line in U.S. society. They bought a copy of The Communist, uh, they they really liked also our class war 2024 flyers, which have Trump and Kamala and indicate complete rejection of both of those options. In fact, uh, the woman told me these should be stickers. Whoever made this, this is like perfect. And I told her, I'm glad you said that because we have stickers uh, already ordered, already already designed, already planned. And we're going to have those too. Um, and above all, they were just, just again, very... Um, surprised and enthused to see people doing something like this and so we exchanged contact info and uh, we'll be in touch about uh, getting them involved in the RCA here in Queens. So above all, a very exciting kickoff day for Class War 2024 and we're excited to see the continued results we get this fall. I think a big takeaway from that is the comrades in New York did not let the barrier of having to be buzzed into apartments prevent them from knocking on people's doors this is the approach that we should take with everything if there's an obstacle in front of us how do we think about solving it rather than kind of just letting it preclude us from doing any work at all what if that barrier is a language barrier though well the comrades in san diego actually encountered this and found 
a way to deal with that. We've learned a few things so far. Um, one of the first ones is preparation. We've really got to pick the right time and the right place to do this. Um, so far, we've realized that Sunday afternoon tends to work best if we want to catch people while they're home. Um, and in terms of the right place, um, we've we've tried a few different neighborhoods in San Diego, but recently we actually tried a new neighborhood uh, called City Heights, which is relatively more working class, uh, but it's also full of monolingual Spanish speakers. Um, so we had to overcome this obstacle somehow. Um, and what we did was we split into groups where one person in each group was a fluent Spanish speaker. And this allowed us to have tons of really great conversations with people um, who were super excited actually to see revolutionaries at their doorstep uh, and, and super eager to tell us about all the oppression, uh, all the horrors that, that they and their families face under capitalism. Another lesson that we learned uh, so far is that flexibility is really key when we're having these kinds of conversations. The working class is is not a monolith and some people have, you know, wrong ideas and, and, and uh, biases. And instead of attacking those, uh, what we can do is we can actually develop whatever kernel of truth there is in what they're saying and develop it in the direction of, of class solidarity, of class consciousness, and ultimately the need for a revolutionary party, which you know, we're happy to inform them they can help build uh, by becoming a sustainer or by, by joining our party right then and there. Hey, my name is Lily. Um, I'm in the San Diego area and I've been door knocking a few times now. Um, and I think a lot of my most memorable interactions have, um, have started with someone saying that, that they're ignorant about politics. And, you know, I would respond by saying that it's completely understandable to be uninterested in politics as we know it now. Um, and I would quickly say that this is not that type of politics, but rather we're building a workers party um, that doesn't work through the Democrats, doesn't try to work through the Republicans, um, and it aims to overthrow the rich and the powerful in this country who use our tax money to drop bombs on innocent people um, rather than funding health care or education. Um, and so after we clarified what kind of politics we're talking about, he was really eager to engage in conversation. Uh, we talked about like the rising cost of living and, um, you know, which is a very, very big thing in San Diego. Um, his struggles as somebody working full time and going to school. Um, and he was really excited to read our pamphlet and to, to read the other articles um, from our website to see if it was something he wanted to join. I was able to talk to people who were open to talking to me in my very broken Spanish. Um, but I told them that creemos que los democratas y los republicanos son partidos para los ricos, no para los trabajadoras, um, which translates to we believe that the Democrats and the Republicans are parties for the rich, not for the workers. And so we would tell them that they would nod along and, and, and you know, we could tell that they, they felt similarly. Um, and so we would direct them to our website where they could translate the whole page into Spanish. Um, and they were super interested to do so. And I think that, you know, we should continue to push ourselves to get outside of our comfort zone and explain our ideas to everyone that we can. And I think, you know, speaking in Spanish and talking about our ideas in Spanish actually helped me be more concise in explaining what it is about the Democrats and the Republicans that make it so they don't represent the working class. And it's because their parties for the rich, for the ruling class. Um, and yeah, so I think this really helped me clarify how I want to approach my conversations in English too. Um, I think it was overall a, a really great experience. One resident uh, really, really comes to mind here. She opened her door, it was about halfway, but she saw our leaflet on Palestine and was way more eager to have a conversation. And she said, what are you guys out here doing? And we said, we're out here talking to people in this, in this neighborhood, uh, workers such as ourselves, who are fed up with the capitalist system and fed up with both of these parties. And she said, yeah, I really hate what Biden's doing. And he's handling the Palestine situation very awfully. And it's very upsetting. And we said, yeah, we completely agree with you. That's the purpose of this party we're building is to point, be able to point the way forward. And she said, wow, I really love what you guys are doing. And she thanked us for being out here in the, in the rain, uh, especially. 
as, as, a, as a good gesture. Um, and she said that she would, you know, take this leaflet, uh, take this, this sticker that we gave her, and she said she would spread the word to people in the neighborhood. She also pointed out specific people in her complex and around the neighborhood who she thought would be interested in maybe even getting involved in something like our party. Uh, you know, door knocking really requires comrades to think on their feet. It makes us discuss our politics, not in a watered down way, but in a way that gets to the heart of things, I think. Because for most working people, you know, Marxism is pretty foreign to them. But the experience of exploitation, oppression, and class rage is with them day in, day out, right? And, you know, comrades do face rejection often when we are out door knocking. Either people aren't home or have no interest. And because of our limited time and number of comrades able to cover an area, we can't cast a very wide net in one go. But for all the rejection, if we can get just one or two who are inspired to join the party or who don't but mention to their kid or their friends that communists were out talking to people, asking about what they're fed up with and how things could be different, that's crucial, right? I remember door knocking and trying to get this guy who was sitting on his porch smoking a cigarette to talk to me about Palestine and how messed up it is. He wasn't really interested, but I kind of, you know, left a pamphlet lying beside him. And a minute or two later, as we're walking away, he, he comes running, jogging down the street after me. And he evidently had looked at the pamphlet and he said, oh, my God, yeah, no, my friend is super into this. Like, let me give you his number. And so I, you know, I exchanged the information. And so all of these, you know, kind of, you never know what sort of butterfly effect you're gonna have. And it's crucial that we, that we look for all avenues to, to bring these ideas to people and put forward the communist position, especially right now during the election season. So you can see that even if we don't recruit people to become an active member of the party, we are gaining people that are sympathetic to our perspective we are building a base of sustaining members, those that can actually, if they're not able to participate actively in the party, they can contribute with donations, monthly donations, subscriptions to the paper. And not only are they providing financial support for our party, but they're also receiving the perspective in their email or in their mailbox every month. And like the comrades said here, even if they don't do any of that, they might direct us to somebody that they think would be interested in our ideas. Many such cases have resulted in somebody being recruited, not by us directly, but by their friend who ends up recruiting communists and they're not even in the party. In fact, when we approach people, we should approach them with the willingness to get them involved immediately. And in fact, we have to explain the necessity of getting involved immediately. If we find somebody with enthusiasm for what we're doing, we should ask them that day to become members and to become involved in the activity that we're doing in that moment. That if they are able to, then they should come with us to door knock, come with us to leaflet to table. Our door knocking campaign exposes the possibility that we can connect people with these ideas to people that they didn't even consider discussing these sorts of issues with. As our comrade Jan in Philadelphia points out about door knocking in apartments. We can literally go and like knock on three doors at once. And that actually created a very interesting effect where two neighbors that are like right next to each other open the door at the same time, have this conversation. And the neighbor like looks that another comrade is talking to their neighbor and, and they're nodding in approval and like smiling at that, you know, seeing that we're asking literally everyone on the block about it. We also wrote a bunch of leaflets titled, are you tired of being asked to vote? And that has, you know, received a huge response. And if we have like a lot of leaflets, we leave them like on, under the carpet uh, at, at the front door. I'm, what I'm really excited about is, you know, those neighbors know each other at all. They talk to each other. They will probably mention, you know, those who have conversations with us, they'll probably mention us and they'll talk to each other about it. And this is, you know, something they mentioned, forgot where, but something important is that, you know, we need to make RCA a household name. We need to make sure everyone knows about us so that when more crises hit, they know where to go. Basically what we do, we go to like very working class neighborhoods and knock on every single door. A quarter to a fifth open the door and every single conversation we're able to connect on one or another level. I usually just say, hey, I'm Jan with the Revolutionary Communists of America and I want to ask you a question. Are you sick and tired of both Democrats and Republicans? and continue from there. You know, if they're sick of both parties, I can be like, hey, yeah, I absolutely agree. I think both of these parties, you know, don't represent our interests. And then they usually pick up from there. Or if they're saying, 
uh, like they're apolitical, we can take it, you know, from, from here, bring up, you know, bread and butter issues that are relevant to absolutely everyone. Well, what do you think about, you know, the rising rent and lowering wages? And that gets to, you know, connect. But when they're not in a hurry, and they're just chilling on their porch or walking the dog, those conversations end up being up to like 20, 30 minutes. When I see this happening, when I see their excitement, when I see my explanations make sense to them, and uh, I try to, you know, connect it to the need to build a party and try to get them excited about learning more about communism. So we want to, you know, not just get in touch with this energy that exists there uh, and have good conversations, but also, you know, harness it and try to recruit people to the party. And I try to converge it towards, you know, coming to our open cell meeting where we will explicitly discuss, you know, why we're communists, what our goals are. And our second uh, discussion is, you know, what is the revolution? What is class struggle? And how to take the fight really to all the issues we discuss, which is not, you know, electing AOC or Bernie and entrusting them to do all those reforms for us. But how do we, you know, fight for those reforms ourselves with our own hands? And it usually works great. They're saying, they're like, yeah, I'll absolutely be there. I'll check out your website and they grab the leaflet. We're good at uh, collecting phone numbers. This is also another thing we end with is like, hey, do you want to exchange phone numbers to stay in touch? And most of the time they say, yeah, absolutely. When the conversation has gone great. So for myself, I can say I've had about 40 conversations and I got about seven phone numbers. I think agitation, you know, will inevitably attract, you know, this communist layer if they listen to it, if they're, you know, there for it. But it will also, you know, give us a chance to connect with a developing layer that is, you know, about to become part of the communist layer. There's a layer that is actively making a lot of conclusions right now and are basically, you know, communists without realizing. And all it takes really is for someone to step in and say what everyone already thinks about, but say it out loud. People in big cities should definitely be encouraged to table at parks and on street corners and areas of high foot traffic. But if you live in a place that doesn't have that, then the door knocking is a great tactic to employ. So we recently started a cell out here in Queen Creek, which is a suburb or, I mean, I guess you could say it's probably a rural area of the Phoenix Metro. We have a problem that I feel like the big city comrades don't have, which is that we don't have a lot of public places that have a lot of foot traffic. And to kind of address that, we decided to do a social. One of the local comrades likes to say socialize to organize. So we created this social around the Class War 2024 leaflets. And we went out to the neighborhood to canvas and tell the community about it. There was this one man who opened up and I introduced myself. I said, hi, I'm Zavi with the Revolutionary Communists of America. And we're out here to invite the community to a social and political discussion that we're doing around the election. A lot of people feel really disheartened by both choices and aren't really interested in either Trump or Harris. And when I said that, his eyes kind of lit up and he said, yes. And so I handed him the, the uh, flyer that I'd made for the social. And he said, I'll definitely be there. And uh, it was it was like the second door. And so I was very nervous. And for me, it's just a testament to the fact that even in the suburbs, there are communists out here. There have to be. And we're going to find them. We have to go out boldly everywhere that we're at, not in just the big cities, the metro areas but in the suburbs and rurally as well. And the principle of not counting anything out goes for the people that we're talking to, of course. There's a lot of success in talking to young people. You hear from young people a lot on our podcast. We talk a lot about the communist generation and that can kind of be assumed to mean just young people. But honestly, there are no generations in America that are going to be exempt from the crisis that capitalism is going through and will go through. There are a lot of middle-aged people and older people that share the same perspective as us. So when we approach people, we should come into it with a fresh class-based approach, just like our comrade Jan from Philadelphia discovered. There was this one group of middle-aged, like in their 50s, I would say, and they were just sitting like on their porch, 
and I approached them and I uh, opened the conversation and we had an amazing discussion. They themselves brought up the genocide in Gaza and were saying how, yeah, I feel like they just collect our taxes and the rich don't pay their taxes and then they send billions to murder, you know, Palestinians. They said that yeah, we, we don't trust all these politicians. They don't represent our interests. Whoever we vote for, you know, they say one thing, but they do the complete opposite. Uh, I was like asking them, who do you think they represent really? And that question, you know, everyone was like scratching their heads and thinking, and I held them out a bit. And I said like, hey, do you think it's maybe the rich? And they were like, yeah, absolutely. They like really agreed and thanked me so much for the conversation. And they said, they will show up at the meeting on Sunday. You usually expect younger generations react like this, but it's just, you know, people in their 50s, uh, older workers, they have lost all illusions in American exceptionalism and American prosperity, which is really, really inspiring. And it puts urgency on us to build the party up. So on the first day of the Class War 2024 campaign, um, the Queen's comrades in New York City decided to meet up in Astoria, where we spent about two hours going over uh, issue number five of the communists in order to help sharpen our theories before we uh, hit the streets. And lo and behold, only five minutes into stepping out into the public, um, kind of orienting ourselves, coming up with a game plan, uh, an older gentleman in, in about his 40s was walking past uh, and caught my eyes as I was wearing my hammer and sickle t-shirt with the communist flag in my hands. And I saw him throw up a little fist of solidarity. And I immediately pulled him aside and was like, hey, are you a communist? And before we knew it, you know, within 10 minutes of, of just getting out, um, and reaching out to the public. We already had people um, interested in the cause uh, coming to join us. Later in the day, we swung by a falafel spot. They have um, a lot of Palestinian solidarity flags all over the place, um, genocide Joe pictures uh, up in the windows, and on the floor is uh, tons of pictures of Netanyahu and Zionists that you get to uh, gleefully walk all over their face um, as you head to place your order. But truly enough, um, all the workers in there were more than excited to talk to us. Um, we handed them many of our class war pamphlets, um, which were a perfect jumping off point in order to get these conversations started. Every opportunity to put our perspective forward should be taken. There are plenty of people out there among various age groups and backgrounds that agree with our perspective and maybe they haven't been introduced to it yet but once they do they realize that this is the perspective that they have and it's finally been given an expression and not only that but there is a party to organize in along those perspectives like it was said before we can't count anybody out based on our assumptions obviously if people count themselves out in the conversation that's a different story there are people that Maybe they don't agree with us on all things, and maybe they have illusions in one of the two parties. We should still find a way to speak to these people. And that goes with both forms of lesser evilism. There are people that believe that Kamala Harris is the lesser of the two evils, but there's also people that think that Donald Trump is the lesser of two evils and, and represents a challenge to the status quo. Even with workers that hold those illusions, we have to find a way to reach them. Even if they say, yeah, I think I'll vote for Trump this year. You don't stop the conversation there, you know, ask them, why do you think Trump? Why do you think, you know, he is the answer? And usually you don't have like a very concrete or firm answer. It's just like a hunch. It's like an illusion that is very easy to dispel. You know, it's enough to just mention that He's from the class of the rich, and he's, you know, ultimately doing this out of his self-interest. And all he does is, you know, try to connect to us workers with demagogy, a complete lie that uh, the economy is, go is getting worse because of the immigrants. And when you clarified that, so the two people I talked to got their head scratching. They were like interested and they're like, give me that leaflet, I'll look into it. <laughs> After our founding Congress in Philadelphia, I flew to my mom's house in Southern Idaho, which is a very conservative area. Her and her husband are both huge Trump supporters. My mom starts her days off by watching Fox News. They're small business owners um, and have really struggled with money their entire lives. They are deeply dissatisfied with the direction our country is going in, like most Americans. They are worried about inflation, gas prices. They're upset about all the money we're sending to foreign countries like Ukraine. 
And usually we have a hard rule against talking about politics because we generally disagree on every single issue. But this time around, they asked me to explain to them why I'm a communist. They seemed very interested in my class war 2024 brochure that says neither party represents the working class in big text on the front. Um, and they, they seemed surprised that communists don't support the Democrats. But over the course of a couple of days, I was able to win them over to our ideas. There was seriously not a single point I made that they disagreed with after I patiently explained it and answered all of their questions. We talked about how all the profit that corporations make are just stolen wages from workers and that billionaires do absolutely nothing to contribute to our society. We also talked about how the ruling class uses identity politics to divide the working class. We even talked about the successes of the Bolsheviks after the 1917 revolution and why the Soviet Union degenerated under Stalin. And at one point, my mom said, well, why don't you just stop calling yourselves communists? So it was really only the terminology that she seemed to have a problem with. And her husband asked me about our views on the Second Amendment. And I told him that as communists, we don't support gun control because it would mean the working class majority giving more power to the state and the police. And he responded with, well, I guess I might just be a communist. So, you know, my family, they're just as dissatisfied with the status quo as we are. They are well aware that we live in a dying empire and that the political elite will not be the ones to save us. I think that that story about the comrades parents is a good way to remind people that it's not just door knocking it's not just tabling or the formal planned activities of going out and trying to meet random people but even engaging in the political activity in our lives when the opportunity presents itself with our family and friends as our comrade here in ventura that you're about to hear from learned that an opportunity can pop up in a, in a variety of situations for this comrade. It was getting on the mic to talk to classmates. So I'm a first year student at my local community college, Ventura College, and we had an orientation a couple weeks ago. We were reading articles about the stigma on community colleges and community college students. Uh, one was a New York Times article and one was a Forbes article. There was a blatant lack of, of class analysis in both articles. And then one person from the table would go up in front of the class, get on the microphone and share what they learned. And so to the whole of the orientation of first year students, I went up and I, I stated that if there is a stigma uh, on community colleges and community college students, it's a, it's a stigma against working class people, right? Uh, because working class people can't always afford to go straight to university, you know? Some people have to save up money before they do that if they're ever even able to afford to do it at all. Some people have to get a part-time job alongside their studies to be able to support themselves and or their family. Everybody applauded and was agreeing with me. The faculty who was running the orientation, not knowing that I was uh, sort of propagandizing, uh, they said, yeah, great critical thinking skills, you know, drawing the articles along class lines. So what we all need to do is is go into our schools and uh, and tie the issues that they face into uh, the the root cause of, of all of these issues. For this fall offensive, let's just uh, <laughs> let's view everything through our Marxist lenses, right? Do what we can to build the party and to show everybody that the issues that they face are directly caused by one one thing, uh, and that one thing is capitalism. And it's not just college students; we are also training people that are younger and coming to these conclusions as high schoolers you know this generation of students is also realizing that capitalism offers no future for them and so our high school comrades also have to go through this process and learn through activity also you know this has been an amazing training ground for our newest comrades especially high schoolers they're struggling to you know connect the points connect the ideas, uh, connect the discontent with the revolutionary Marxist program. And they were feeling like maybe we need to try a different neighborhood, maybe a different block. 
And I told them, hey, even if in one hour we get two responses, we should be, we should absolutely be able to connect with these people. And that's a great point to reintroduce something that we talked about a couple episodes ago, that what we're engaging in is also a learning process, a collective learning process as an organization. And what this podcast serves to offer you is some insight into some of the ways that you can reach people through the Class War 2024 campaign. It's not just door knocking or tabling. It's it's also engaging in political agitation in every area of our lives. We have to be the communists no matter where we are, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our families, because you never know when you're going to meet somebody or reach somebody that needed to hear this perspective and, and didn't know that the RCA existed. To give one example of which I was personally uh, witness to was here in Arlington, Texas. The comrades and I went to eat lunch and kind of do a recap and discussion on what we had done that day. And we were wearing our RCA shirts. And because of that, somebody came up to us and, and asked what the shirt meant. And after explaining that we were trying to build a party for the working class because neither political party that is represented by the two presidential options is going to save the working class. The working class needed their own party. And we wanted to create a world in which the workers democratically decided how our economy runs, where our resources go, instead of our wealth being siphoned off for the billionaires to decide what gets done with it. These two workers were excited to hear what we had to say and immediately wanted material. And so we got our brochures to them and they both took a stack each and they both bought a paper. And one of them remarked that they were really excited to read the paper that night when they went to bed. And that person's going to a meeting in which they may become a member. And that's somebody that we wouldn't have run into if we weren't constantly being the communist everywhere we went. That includes wearing your shirt but it also includes having the paper with you. Here in Arlington, I like to tell comrades that the paper should basically be a part of your outfit that day, that you should bring it wherever you go. Somebody should always be able to tell that you're a communist because many such instances create opportunities to recruit. That again was, was something that I was witness to, having a meeting uh, not too far away from Arlington at a coffee shop we were distributing the papers after the new issue number five got delivered to us. And because we had the papers on a table, somebody passed by and, and pointed at the paper and said, oh, the real news. And they tried to just keep walking. We said, wait, wait, are you a communist? And they said, oh, I don't know. Uh, I don't really know a lot about it. So I basically said to them that what we wanted was a world where the workers are in power and not a handful of billionaires or bureaucrats deciding what to do with the profit that they extract from the working class. And one of the ways in which they dominate us is with the media that obviously he had a distaste for. I then asked him, well, where did you get your news from a working class perspective? And he said, uh, I, I don't really, basically. And I said, well, this is, this is our media. This is the working class media. This is where, from the worker's perspective, we can analyze what is happening with the world around us and drawing it back to the ultimate source of those problems, which is the capitalist system. And our paper not only talks about those problems, but how we can solve it and how we intend to change the world. And so after that explanation, he bought a paper. And the really important thing was that we got his info so that we could discuss the contents of the paper and hopefully recruit him. That wouldn't have happened if we hadn't brought the paper with us wherever we went and left it out in the open. Just because these accidental moments can mean the difference between somebody being pessimistic and not having an option outside of the two-party system and having an actual optimistic direction to go in which is the only option, which is, is revolution. The only optimistic path forward is revolution. Some more smaller reports that we got were on this question of, yeah, going into pubs and bars and restaurants and things like that. There are two instances 
in which comrades have recently gotten contacts at bars because they had the paper out, one in Seattle and another one here in Texas, where one comrade in Seattle actually stood up and gave an agitational speech. Some people weren't really into it, but there was a group of people that came and spoke to the comrades and wanted the material. And one of them ended up being the owner of the bar and said that they agreed with what they were doing and that they appreciated that they were there and excited that somebody was fighting. So you have to be the communist everywhere you go. That includes every aspect of our life, the random encounters that we can have at work or at school, or even when we're out socializing, as well as creating the opportunities, the tabling and the door knocking that we have to engage in. We have to be creative about this. We can't limit ourselves to just what's been outlined. There's a lot of fresh ideas that come that you may have and that you should implement and that that's only going to happen through the collective learning process uh, of the organization. So if you're not a member and you have ideas, reach out to join us. There's a link in the description to join the party. And we have the reports link to send to our paper. If you have something that you want to send to be published in the paper, if you have a report that is similar to this, please send that to us so that we can collectively learn from the experiences like we did with this episode. Hopefully these examples give you some inspiration to work with. Go download the brochure that we have, the Class War 2024 brochure. Get the posters that we have, read the articles, and go out widely, share the brochures and the material, and go find the future members of the Revolutionary Communists of America.